Good morning and welcome. Before I share this video with you this morning, I just wanted to give you a little background. Guru Nanak is the founder of the Sikh faith tradition. And he was alive around the mid 1400s and left this earthly plane, I guess when he was about 70 years old. And the word guru means spiritual teacher. And Guru Nanak was a spiritual teacher who was called the master teacher, just like Jesus, Buddha, Mary Magdalene, the Dalai Lama today, Pema Chodron, and so many more who are, we consider to be master teachers. Now in this video, a current day spiritual teacher of the Sikh faith tradition shares their belief about oneness. Guru Nanak Dev Ji did not believe in God. Guru Nanak Dev Ji knew God. And there's a very big difference. And when we still just believe in God, God always remains far away. We talk about dedicate your life to God, praise God. Well, what is God? Maybe with a white beard sitting in the clouds. Is this the God that Guru Nanak Dev Ji is talking about? The truth of the matter is the whole of Gurmat wisdom has been summarized most beautifully and so intelligently into one single digit. Ik means that everything in the whole entire creation is one thing that looks like many different things. You go out into nature and you look at a mountain and you look at lakes. But the thought that comes in our mind is, wow, why Guru? This nature that you've made is beautiful. Because for us, why Guru is far away? And we say, why Guru? Thank you for making this. When do we ever say, I can see you in the river. I can see you in the birds. I can see you in the sky. I can see you in everyone. I can see you in me. The wave doesn't understand that it is the ocean. The human doesn't understand that it is God. Sab gobind hai. Sab gobind hai. Gobind bin nahi koi. Everything is God. Everything is God. There is nothing except God. The God that we're praying to is right here. What do we do with this wisdom? How does it change our life? Can you accept that all the people that you don't like are God? You say, how can they be God? There's a reason why I don't like them is because they did something horrible. That way of thinking allows us to have enemies. This way of thinking doesn't allow us to have enemies. You have to see everyone as the same thing. And that hurts our ego. So how do we take a concept like God and make it real? At what point can we see God? Why aren't we saying I myself am also God and you are also God? Because Guru Nanak Dev Ji says, if you want to walk on this path, you have to give something up. Don't come to the Guru with your shopping list and ask to take something away. I am has to disappear and when you get rid of I am all that is left is God will you drop your old understanding today because you don't know if you have a tomorrow you have to be willing to change your thoughts and the Guru is saying that you are not separate from God understand the wisdom of the Guru so that we can help the whole world and show the whole world this really is the wisdom that helps everyone. If this was happening, there would be no wars, there would be no enemies because Gurbani really is the wisdom in this age of darkness. Guru Nanak Dev Ji so in this 
short video clip where the sick teacher and sick is spelt S-I-H-K, as you see on the screen, shares the principle of oneness as it is taught in the sick faith tradition. We can closely see if you've been in unity for a while and have studied the unity teachings that the teachings align. One, unity believes also that there is one power and one present God. We also believe that God is not an anthropomorphic, some deity, some male figure with a white beard that resides out there in the heavens, but is the very substance, the breath of creation, the whole of creation. And that we are one with all of creation. And that if we are one with all of creation, everything is divine. Everything is God. And I really love when he shared this quote where he spoke about this, where he shares everything in the whole entire creation is one thing that looks like many different things. And he calls us not to speak to a God out there to plead with, but to experience the wonderment of God as the river, as the sky, the trees, the birds, animals of each one of us and of ourselves. Now, most of us, I would believe, or would it maybe be part of um, participating this morning, believe that we are all one with creation. That is not an old teaching. But if we're really honest, we often fall short of living the experience of oneness. Yes, we have moments when we are out in nature and we feel the wind on our skin or the sun kissing us and warming our bodies or when we are in prayer and meditation and we tap into for a moment or perhaps more into the stillness where there is no thing. And that experience of oneness fills us, warms us and brings us into a sense of peace and joy. But as we begin to move on with our day-to-day -day activities, our daily living, we become mindless. We begin to live on, so to speak, automatic pilot. And then all too often, our personality selves are in the driver's seat of our lives. And we refer to the personality self within unity as the I or me. And many of you might have noticed when he said the spiritual teacher of the Sikh tradition in that video shared, get rid of the I am. So for unity's teaching, the I and the me is the separate self, the personality self, and their teaching the whole I am is the separateness. You get to decide which one you choose which one resonates with you. But nevertheless, when our personality selves are in the driver's seat of our lives, our programming is in charge. And very quickly, if there is someone we disagree with or do not like, we find it very difficult to accept them as God. And we also find it many times difficult to really not just know in our brains, within our belief system, that we are divine, that we are God, but often we are even distanced from that realization, that wonder, that beauty, that knowingness at the depth of our beingness. 
So in order to return back from our programming and to remove the personality self, so to speak, from the driver's seat, Valerie Kaur, in her book, See No Stranger, and Valerie is also from the Sikh faith tradition, gives us a roadmap. And first I want to, gives us a roadmap how to return from that separateness, that judgment that we hold sometimes of ourselves and in others, um, back to home, back to love, back to that sense of wonder. And before I go over the practice of wonder, which we are being called into today, I would like to explain how she defines other. So this whole journey in See No Stranger is about bringing us back to the truth of our being, to knowing how to love ourselves, how to love others, how to love our opponents. And she makes a, dis a distinction between others and opponents. Others are really people that we encounter in our day-to-day -day lives that we do not know, but frequently we make assumptions about. And they can even be people within our own families and circles. Opponent, not that I'm gonna get into that today, is someone that we really have deep disdain and hatred. And so we will talk about that at another time. So, you know, when we are filled with our projections or disappointments, um, when it comes to another person, sometimes it's hard to take that leap into back into oneness back into that state of divine love, to love without conditions. So Valerie invites us to take the first step back to journeying to love. And that is by engaging in the practice of wonder. And again, wonder is that first building black block to love. If we look at the definition of wonder, it means to be filled with a sense of awe, a sense of openness and of curiosity. And when we bring that sense of awe and wonder and openness to another person, it is an invitation to look upon their face and to say, like we did in the meditation, you are a part of me, I do not yet know. Say that to yourself again. You are a part of me. I do not yet know. Notice that there is an openness. It invites us to take whatever disappointment or assumption that we are holding about someone. And we make assumptions of people. We can size them up in a minute, which I will talk about in a moment. So we, when we say you are a part of me, I do not yet know, we open the door to move past those assumptions and into that state of curiosity. And Valerie shares, to wonder about another person is to open ourselves up to their thoughts and experiences, their pains and joys, their wants and needs. It's an orientation of humility. It's recognizing that they are as complex and unique and vast to themselves as we are to ourselves. Wondering about another person gives us information to how to love them. Wondering about another person gives us information how to love them. When we are young and carefree, that sense of wonder, feeling that sense of curiosity and openness comes very natural to us. But slowly, it is suppressed within us. We hear things like, stop playing in the mud, you're gonna get too dirty or stop daydreaming. 
come on, you got to get all your chores done. Let's get to homework. Let's get to soccer. And before we know it, little by little, we do not engage in that sense of wonder. Valerie was blessed. And many, many, maybe many of you are blessed as well to have had that sense of wonder deeply cultivated within her. It's part of the Sikh faith tradition. And she shares a story, I think I touched on it last week, from when she was six years old and she was playing on the playground. She lived in California. And as she was having a wonderful time with her friends, a boy, a classmate of her, came up to her and said, to her face, get out of here, black dog. And he kept calling her a black dog. And as he was yelling those words, black dog, black dog, black dog, her friends started to distance themselves from her. They were afraid to be around her. They were wondering, should I be her friend? But in that moment, she remembers a sense of shame rising within her besides hurt. And she even said she could feel her skin stinging and she felt like a foreigner in her own body. She ran home from school that day. She lived with her grandfather, Grandpa G, who is beloved to her and she ran to him tearful. She shared what happened and he scooped her up in his lap like he would always do, wipe away her tears. And then he would begin to share prayers and poems. And then this particular day, he shared the origin story of the Sikh tradition that talks about oneness, that talks about um, wonderment. And then after he read the origin story, he began to sing the song of oneness. And she felt her body relaxing. She felt that safety. She felt that peace arising in her as she felt love embrace her. And at that moment, he whispered the words, Valerie, see no stranger see no enemy. And then he invited her to wonder about the boy on the playground. Oh, I wonder what he needs. I wonder what he wants. What makes him happy? Such a profound experience and a profound way to be raised. And as she got older, Grandpa G shared this with Valerie, with her. Love is a dangerous business. For if I look upon the world through the eyes of wonder and I choose to see another as my sister, my brother, my sibling, as a part of me I do not yet know, then I must be willing to let another's grief into my heart. And I must be willing to stand with another when he, she, they is in harm's way. Those who refuse to love you, Valerie, have forgotten how to wonder about you. Don't let that shut down your ability to wonder about them. Pretty powerful. And it is not a typical way we are raised or what is shared with us when we encounter someone who is unfair or who hurts us. I remember my ex-husband sharing with me when he was around a story about from when he was around Valerie's age, he was seven or eight years old and he was playing in the neighborhood on his block and a group of boys who were older than him began bullying them and pushing him around. And he ran home and, the, and as he got to the front door and his father saw him teary-eyed, 
he said, he locked the door and he said, no, you're not allowed in here. You need to get back out there. Stop being a sissy. You need to learn how to fight and be a man. And I remember feeling like so, you know, raising, at, you know, boys of my own and, you know, just feeling the sadness of that. And so maybe we don't have that particular experience or maybe as a male that some in some form that happened to you, but maybe this sounds familiar, you know, when a teacher or a friend, you know, thought that they weren't, or you thought they weren't kind or weren't fair to you or called you a name. And maybe instead of being called into a sense of purity, curiosity, see no stranger, see, you know, wondering about what, you know, they need or want, maybe you were told like, oh, they're stupid. Oh, they don't know what they're doing. Oh, you know, they're greedy, selfish, and they are somebody that we need to avoid at all costs. Now, I'm not saying I'm talking about if you're in harm's way physically that we don't, you know, separate ourselves. So more than ever, it is so important for us to cult that, cultivate that wonder because our judgments, our hurts, our familiar and society, societal conditioning, and all of those hurts that we have that are unhealed within us, all of that stands in the way of experience or oneness, stands in the way or actually blocks that openness, that sense of wonder and curiosity. And scientists in the field of neurobiology actually even said that, um, have proven that that part of our survival, part of our brain, reptilian part of our brain, and other part of the earlier formations of our brain, that their studies show that our minds are primed to see the world in terms of us and them. And that in a split section, sec second, we decide if someone is part of our group or is not part of our group. And that happens before we have our first conscious thought. And even our bodies, our survival aspect of the physical body are primed to release hormones, to trust and listen to those we see as part of us and to fear, avoid, resent, and even hate those that seem that they are different. And so another thing that gets in the way, not only is our upbringing, um, our neurobiology, but also we have been indoctrinated in stereotypes. You cannot be part of this country and even other countries and not know that stereotypes are in the air we breathe, on TV, in the me media. They may not be spoken, but their messaging is real clear. And all of us, as spiritually as we are, unless we are at that master level, have unconscious bias. And there was a sharing that um, in her book, where in her study, that um, there's many of those stereotypes of each of the groups I have listed here on the screen, but she honed it into like a word or so for each of these groups that of the stereotypes that are embedded in our society here in the United States, that we see sick, sick and Muslim people as terrorists, blacks as criminal, brown people as illegal, indigenous as savage, Jews as controlling, Hindu as primitive, Asians as untrustworthy, queers and trans as sinful, the disabled as pitiful, and women and girls as someone else's property. They may not be operating in the conscious, your conscious mind, but they are in our society. And I know many of us have opened our awareness and are coming from a higher place, but it is important to know the insidiousness of the unconscious bias because they are in the fabric of our institutions, in our laws, and so on, and so on. 
So my friends, if we have that desire to live more fully from the consciousness of oneness, of having not just a fleeting moment of oneness, to live from our divine essence of love, let us engage the practice of wonder. Let us be willing. And so in the book, See No Stranger, she invites you to a couple of practices that engage wonder. One, day to day, and, and, and this reflective, meditative, and day to day remind me, we just finished living originally, and there was the general practice and the formal practice, and this has hints of that. So the day-to-day -day practice, she invites you just as you're moving about your day, wherever you're going, if you're going to the store, if you do go into work or people you see on the Zoom screen, to just say, sister, brother, sibling, aunt, uncle, grandfather, daughter, my child, and just notice what rises, or you can see you are someone you are a part of me that I do not yet know. That's it. Just simply notice what happens in your body, what feelings arise, and just begin that practice as you move throughout your day. And she invites you into a more reflective and meditative. If you notice that a judgment rises within you, take some time to reflect later on. And just like Grandpa G, started Valerie off with prayer, song, chanting, stories, brings us back down into that, to our home base, into the center of our heart. And then as we breathe in and out of our heart in that centered place, in the wisdom of our heart, we can ask, what excites you? What frightens you? What do you need? want? What breaks your heart? What is your story? And simply just be willing to say, what did you have for dinner? Because when we engage wonder and we open that door, when we say you are a part of me, I do not yet know, we move to that willingness of openness. And so I hope you will join me this week in practicing wonder. And I end with a prayer called empty. I believe there is a field waiting for us where we all frolic and dance with the sun on our backs and smiles on every face. A place where only love exists, a place where we are all one race. But I can't hide this emptiness I feel. And questions arise. Why are we here in this human form? What is this world for? Is there more? Sometimes I could barely see. And oh, I ask, open my eyes, allow me to breathe and wonder. The human existence sometimes doesn't make sense. The fear, the sorrow, the ugliness, the death. We put up barriers in our minds and in our hearts. We put up barriers in this world, which is why it is falling apart and being dismantled. The emptiness I feel is a cry for change in our souls. I know it. I felt it. Love will heal our emptiness. Love for me and love for you. Love for my brother, sister, siblings, the ones I know and the ones I don't know. We are one in the same, made in the likeness and image of source of God. Can you see it now? Unity is the life force. We must relinquish separateness and come together as one. So I urge you to pause and open your eyes and wonder. See things from a different perspective. Oneness is the ultimate prize. Our emptiness will be filled and there will be nothing more we will need. Namaste.